First of all, thank you very much to Elio and Thomas for uh, the invitation and also for putting together this very, very interesting program. And I'm, uh, it's an honor to, to start uh, in fact with uh, KITAIF models and materials. This is a field of research that has been growing um, from uh, since 2009, I can say. And um, there are a lot of aspects to this field that uh, still are very open. And today what I would like to do is uh, to give um, a little overview. It's very difficult to make an overview of all what has been done up to now, but at least to show you some aspects and where are the open problems and where are the progress in, in the field. And um, basically in my title, I say the conspiracy of spin orbital and lattice degrees of freedom. And this is what I want to show to you that in these kind of uh, systems or physics, these three types of degrees of freedom are very much intertwined. Um, of course, I would like to start with the motivation why we are studying this type of um, models and materials. So basically our goal is to find or to make exotic uh, spin states. So I'm going to today to basically work and talk about magnetism. And what we want to do is uh, to have exotic spin states that are beyond uh, paramagnets or um, antiferromagnets or ferromagnets. And the question is where we go and get these type of uh, exotic spin states. So of course here I would like to quote Phil Anderson who already in the seventies was one while thinking about the ground state of a triangular, uh, of a triangular lattice. He was um, talking about the importance of quantum effects in order to induce new types of non-ordered states. And this concept of a quantum spin liquid started in fact um, from his pioneering work. And even though we know that nowadays a triangular lattice, so what he was studying at that time, indeed has an ordered ground state, which is a 120 degrees uh, ordered state, we do have this type of uh, quantum spin liquids in other type of systems. So, let me first um, describe uh, what, how do we define a quantum spin liquid? So this is a cooperative quantum phase without, um, with uh, fluctuating spins down to lowest temperature and without symmetry breaking. So we don't have long range order up to uh, lowest temperatures, but the system shows a type of long range, um, which is a long range entanglement in the ground state. And what is very interesting is that the, the excitations in, the, in these type of states are fractionalized excitations. And here, um, this is my um, technology type of uh, art that I usually add in order to motivate why are we interested in spin liquids. And it's um, in fact, uh, because of these fractionalized excitations. And here, I would just like to uh, mention um, their use for topological quantum computers computers. So for instance, by following the suggestion of Alexei Kitaev, um, by considering, for instance, uh, Majorana fermions and the braiding of this type of fractionalized excitations, which um, you allows you to do operations protected by topology. When you assume that the qubit is built by this uh, type of fractionalized excitations. I'm not saying that this is what I'm going to show today, but definitely this is a very good motivation to study this type of materials with this type of physics. So where are we going to look now to realize these uh, type of ground states and excitations? So of course we need to have quantum fluctuations to survive up to lowest temperature uh, without go entering a long range magnetic order. So one option is of course to consider systems, um, magnetic systems that have a lattice that inherently has geometric frustration. And with that, I mean, if we assume that we have, for instance, a triangular lattice with um, antiferromagnetic nearest neighbor interactions. So as you can see here, um, it's very, so there is a frustration of this third spin because there is no way for this spin to be aligned antiferromagnetically to the other two spins. So this is a typical source of frustration and in fact, the most um, geometrically frustrated lattice that we know of is the Kagome lattice. And um, this is one option. A second option, option is to do Hamiltonian engineering. So uh, how can we reach to have quantum fluctuations um, in, in a 
description in a Hamiltonian description. So basically, by considering a Hamiltonian that contains non-commuting uh, spin terms, or, or in other words, by containing anisotropic interactions. And this type of models is the models I'm going to talk about, uh, the COMPASS model, the Kitayev model, and mostly the reason why we like this type of Hamiltonian engineering, because the idea is, even if you start with a model, which is a mathematical model that um, contains this uh, frustration, what you want to do is to have a model that you can solve exactly, you know exactly which is the ground state and excitations, and then you try to find uh, 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 basically um, some realization of this model in nature. So let me just show you an example of um, materials that are a realization of this geometric frustration. And this is the case of Herbert Schmittheit. This is a spin one half carbomelatis. So basically it's formed by layers of uh, copper atoms with um, localized spin one half on a honeycomb lattice. And indeed this system, the ground state, so there is no long range ordering that has been observed. And moreover, the excitations in this system, so here I'm showing inelastic neutron scattering experiments, um, they show a very diffuse excitation spectrum. And this is already um, hinting to uh, the possibility that the excitations in this system are fractionalized. As you know, in elastic neutron scattering experiments, so you do the measurements with polarized neutrons. So you are measuring excitations of delta uh, S equal to one. So you will get, if you have a system which is ordered with magnon excitations, you will get very well defined uh, an ex excitation spectrum. However, if you, have, if you have fractionalized excitations, this is what you are going to expect, this uh, continuum of excitations. Now, what I want to go is, and this is the title of my talk, I want to go now to this Hamiltonian engineering to the Kitayev materials. And in fact, the field of, um, of the Kitayev materials started by um, this um, model, what we now know as the Kitayev uh, model. And before describing this model, let me ju just go to precursor models, models of it, since there, is a, um, there are a lot of scientists that have been, in fact, working a lot with these type of models before uh, the Kitayev model was suggested. And in fact, um, going back, uh, one of the first um, papers uh, that talk about this type of models, bond-dependent models, uh, in fact, is the, the work of um, Clement Kugel and Daniel Komsky, where at that time they were interested in describing the magnetic interactions in systems that are orbitally degenerate. So in fact, here it's the case of a system which is twofold uh, orbitally degenerate, and they extracted um, an effective Hamiltonian that contains the interaction of the spins and the orbitals. And if we go to the equation 34 of this paper, in fact, um, they talk about the compass model. So they, in fact, they introduced this concept of uh, compass model uh, when they were trying to uh, write down minimal models to describe the interactions between the orbital degrees of freedom. So in fact, there is a whole range of compass models, which basically are characterized by these bond dependent um, interactions. And there, is, and there, is many, there are many groups working on that. So I think um, Maria today will also give a talk on these type of models, but there is a nice review on these models by um, Nursinov and Jerome van den Brink. And what I want to talk today is one of these models, which is the Honeycomb Kitayev model. So what is this model about? So this is an Ising, Mies neighbor Ising model, bond dependent on a honeycomb lattice. So basically I need a C3 type of symmetry. And um, what, let me show you here on the, on the right, how this model works. So the idea is that you have a bond dependent interaction. So if you are, let's say in the Z bond, you will have an SZ, SZ in the Y bond, SY, SY, and then the X bond, SX, SX. And this is a highly frustrated model because if you put yourself here, let's say, on this center spin side, this spin has to uh, interact with the top neighbor with the Z component, with the right neighbor with the Y component, and with the left neighbor with the X component. And since 
the three spin components don't commute with each other, this is a highly frustrated model. And what Alexei Kitayev did, he solved this model exactly. And the way he did that is by introducing um, the uh, representation of the spin operators in terms of four Majorana fermions as uh, shown here. Um, and the Majorana fermions, in fact, these are, these are um, particles that are its own antiparticles and they fulfilled the fermionic commutation relation. So the, these are fermions which have no charge. Now, the solution of this, um, uh, of this exact solution is in fact very nice to have a look at it. Just let me show that in this slide. So now we are substituting this icing, so this uh, spin components in terms of this um, product of two Majorana fermions. These are the C fermions, which are represented here, uh, in fact, by these balls. And these are the, and the B fermions are, in fact, these bonds, uh, bond type of fermions. So these are the localized fermions. So we, we now substitute these spin um, uh, operators into the Hamiltonian. Basically, what we have is that this B, um, this B um, fermions, let me just define this, uh, you, uh, this uh, basically this operator here, these B fermions, in fact, they don't interact with each other. So this is a constant um, of motion in the, in the Hamiltonian, and therefore the Hamiltonian becomes then quadratic. And it can be solved exactly, of course, because it's quadratic. And what we have is that the ground state, if we are here, that all the K, the constants are the same. So we have a ground state, which is a spin liquid, a Z2 spin liquid, which has its excitations, gapless Majorana excitations, and also a gapped uh, static fluxes. So this is beautiful physics. And um, of course, it remained for a while a mathematical model. Um, the question is, uh, and the revolution, I would say, in condensed matter physics was to bring this mathematical model into the world of materials. And this, in fact, um, let's see what conditions we have to uh, introduce to our materials in order to have the realization of this type of a Kitayev model. So the conventional, um, the conventional description of a spin Hamiltonian is usually if I only restrict myself to bilinear interactions. So I will expect to have Heisenberg type of interactions. I will expect maybe if I don't have inversion symmetry, dalginsky moria contributions, which is the vector product. And of course, I may have also the tensor uh, product of spins, which is also what we know as the dipolar contribution. So if we want to have a material where only the Kitayev interaction survives, it means we have to get rid of all the isotropic exchange interactions. We have to get rid of all the jaloginsky moria uh, interactions. And we have to get rid of most of these um, symmetric term interactions, except for those at the diagonal, and they have to be bond dependent. So, so this seems and, and sounds like a lot of restrictions to our materials in order to get a realization of the Kitayev um, uh, spin Hamiltonian. Uh, however, this, uh, this is not as difficult as it seems. And this is in fact, um, the, um, this was shown by George Jacqueline and uh, Guinea at Kaliulin, where they basically showed the recipe of how to realize this um, uh, Hamiltonian. And let me just go, fast through this recipe. So the idea first is I need this bond dependent type of interactions. So this is already telling me that I have to work with uh, spin entities that are uh, bond dependent. And the only way to manage that is to consider that I have a strong spin orbit coupling. Because if I have entities where they are spin and orbital coupled, then I will manage to get, to get this um, bond dependence. So basically my entities are going to be um, the spin orbit coupled uh, type of uh, states. Even though I, from now on, I'm going to continue with the spin operator, my operators are this J effective. And how do we manage to get them in the Hamiltonian? So let's assume that I have a four or five uh, D metals. So because I will need the spin orbit coupling. And let me assume now that I have an occupation, that I am in an octahedral environment and I have an occupation of five electrons. If I am in an octahedral environment of ligands, I will have um, the crystal field splitting into T2G and EG states. Um, I have five 
electrons. So if I now have strong spin orbit coupling, because I am in four or five D um, type of electrons, then I have an extra splitting due to the uh, spin orbit coupling and therefore into J effective three half and one half. And at the end of the day with a strong uh, Coulomb repulsion, I will have in fact these entities that will allow me this bond dependence um, behavior. And the second part of this construction is now let build, let's build the lattice with this um, octahedra. And um, how do I have to build it in order to have only surviving the highs, uh, sorry, the, uh, um, this ising Kitayev type of interaction. So the idea, and this is what uh, George and Guinea showed is, well, let's put this um, octahedra to be edge sharing in this honeycomb lattice. If we put them a edge sharing, we will have that only these two type of interactions are uh, in fact um, surviving. And you see that these two type of interactions, they basically are annihilating each other. So they have a destructive interference. So with that, I'm killing the Heisenberg type of interactions. If I have an inversion center, I also won't have uh, Jaloginsky moria interactions. And what I'm left with is in fact, these um, effective spin one half, one half interactions through the J effective three half interactions. So this is the process that I'm left with. And here it is the importance about this multi-orbitalicity. Without having a multi-orbital uh, system, without having a Kuhn's coupling, I cannot get this uh, Kitayev interaction. So the Kitayev interaction is directly proportional to this property of being a multi-orbital system. And of course, directly proportional to the Coulomb repulsion and um, uh, to the, or inverse proportional to the Coulomb repulsion and the spin orbit coupling. So we have a recipe and um, there are in fact materials in nature that fulfill this type of recipe. And these are two of the most studied ones, which are layered materials precisely of these uh, honeycomb type of lattices. This would be a 4D electrons and this would be 5D electrons. However, nature is not as perfect as we would like to have it. So there are also trigonal field splittings. The, the um, for instance, the different energy scales that play a role, they don't have this, uh, this strong hierarchic um, um, process that I would like to have in order to have the, um, only the Kitayev interaction surviving. Nevertheless, it's a very good approximation. And now the next step is, um, so let's now try to find out each other coupling constants. So how I describe the spin model for these materials. So um, taking into account that I have all these uh, scales that come into play. So this is how um, uh, we come in. Let me just show you that and as a first, uh, as, as a first um, idea of how these exchange interactions uh, are dependent on, in fact, the chemistry of the system. So the hybridization and the bonding. Here I'm just showing a perturbation expansion of taking the multi-orbital Hubbard model, projecting into um, uh, spin orbit uh, states and extracting then this exchange interaction in terms of the parameters of the Hubbard model. And as you can see, we have here on the right um, a very strong dependence of these exchange interactions, the Kitayev, the Heisenberg, and this uh, gamma bipolar term as a function of little changes in the hybridization in the system. Let's say little, little changes on the lattice. And here comes my third degree of freedom that the lattice is going to play an important role in these systems because by manipulating the lattice, I can manipulate very well these exchange interactions. And for instance, if I am in this region, I can have basically surviving only this Kitayev interaction. So what we have done, and we and many other groups have tried to extract these spin models from up initia, starting from, uh, from really first principles. And then, um, and there is a rather good consensus that these materials are described by an dominant Kitayev type of interaction, with, which is ferromagnetic. But there are also other spurious interactions like Nia's neighbor Heisenberg, third Nia's neighbor Heisenberg, as well as some reminiscent um, of diagonal anisotropic terms corresponding to these other components of the dipolar terms. 
And these spurious interactions are responsible for the fact that these materials, in fact, order at low temperatures. So they show a zigzag magnetic order, at least those that I'm showing here. So um, nevertheless, due to these um, anisotropic contributions and these dominant Kitayev interactions, they still have um, very exotic low symmetry type of, or, or let's say very exotic inter um, excitations coming from these low symmetry interactions. And here I'm showing just um, some, because dynamics is also one, of, response functions is also one of the subjects of this, uh, of this workshop. I'm showing here um, two experiments in elastic neutron scattering experiments and ESR done on alpha ruthenium trichloride. And here I'm showing at temperatures, which is in this ordered phase. And as you can see, the experiment shows that I have magnons. However, and due to these um, anisotropic interactions, I have um, a strong continuum, which is not what you would expect when you have a Heisenberg type of description. And this um, can be reproduced by these type of models when you solve them, for instance, with exact diagonalization. And the question and the interpretation is, what is this continuum? Is this a magnon decay or is this Majorana excitations, uh, manifestation of Majorana excitations? So this is um, one of the um, discussions uh, that have been going on along this year. Now here, what I'm showing is ESR. So basically how the excitation, so ESR probes basically these excitations at the gamma, so at the zero, zero point um, with, a man, with an applied magnetic field. And one can uh, see how at a critical magnetic field, this is a magnetic field uh, applied per parallel to these layers, the long range antiferromagnetic order disappears. And then there is a flurry of um, excitations up to you go to this almost polarized phase. And the, the, let's say the point of discussion is this region where the long range order disappears um, and all started by these measurements from Yuji Matsuda and collaborators in Tokyo where they uh, reported the, uh, in fact, that they could observe quantized thermal conductivity um, on the uh, magnetic field, which would uh, in fact hint to the fact that there is a manifestation of a chiral spin liquid once you have uh, suppressed the long range magnetic order. Now, um, this has been a point of, and is a point of controversy, um, whether this is um, in fact observed or not, and what does it mean? Uh, there are recently in fact uh, new works on, in this direction, for instance, by the group of Ong in Princeton and now by uh, Hide Takagi here, here, I say here, I'm not here, I'm not at the Max Planck Institute, but I, um, it's our host institu institution today. So here at the Max Planck Institute, Hide Takagi and collaborators have been also reporting some new measurements. So it's, it's, it's uh, still a very, very in interesting field of research. Um, what I want to touch upon now is not so much about the effect of uh, applying magnetic fields and suppressing this long range order and whether there is an existence of a spin liquid phase or not um, uh, by introducing this external field. I want to go into the direction of manipulating the lattice. If you want at the end, we can also discuss more on this region, but what I want to go now is how, how can I get rid of this long range order and maybe touch upon a spin liquid. So if I manage to push the system into the direction that only these interactions survive, then um, this is also a way of having a realization of this spin liquid. And as I showed to you, these um, exchange interactions are extremely sensitive to small changes in the lattice. So this is what I would like to talk now um, for the next slides. What has been done and what, um, what is being done in this direction? So of course, manipulating the lattice, the first thing that you think of is, well, let's apply pressure, right? So this is a, a external pressure. This is probably the first experiment that you think about. So this is what has been done, in fact, applying pressure on this system. And we have done simulations on that. And what happens is, in fact, what you expect that will happen and it's not what you want that it happens. So what happens when you apply pressure in this type, in these honeycomb lattices. So what happens then is that here I'm showing the different, the different possible um, uh, hopping uh, 
processes that you can have in the, in the system or call it hybridization processes, the ones that are most uh, important in the description of these uh, low energy spin Hamiltonians. And there is this one here, which is basically what we call the direct hopping dxy dxy. So when you press the system, what happens is that you enhance this type of hy hybridization. And by enhancing this type of uh, hybridization, what happens is that at the critical pressure, basically you are going to uh, build singlets, and this is what happens, the ruthenium, uh, the electrons build singlets, and the lattice distorts, distorts in this fashion. And this is uh, what um, an up initial uh, relaxation type of uh, description gives you. This is uh, our um, simulations, and this is what the experiments observe. So what I'm showing here is conductivity measurements as a function of pressure that are basically probing the phonons in, in the system, what is happening to the phonons. And we, if we just follow this one phonon here, you see this one here, there is a splitting starting, which corresponds to the fact that the lattice distorts and distorts due to this process. So, and then we are done. So we have, we have, built, we have built singlets. So this is like a, a, a crystal, uh, a bond crystal lattice. So we are not going to expect, expect here a spin liquid type of behavior. Now, other ways of, now what we need is not to press the lattice, but we need to basically inflate the lattice. So a uh, tensile type of uh, strain. So how can we manage that? So a way of managing tensile strain is by building heterostructures. And since now I'm basically concentrating on this alpha ruthenium trichloride, as I uh, was showing in the previous slide, this system is a van der Waals system. So these layers are basically stuck upon the other without any uh, other kind of uh, cation or an, an ion in between. So basically it's very easy in principle to just form heterostructures of um, this material with other type of uh, substrates. So one idea has been, okay, so why don't we consider as a substrate um, graphene? Um, graphene, as you know, is a two-dimensional Dirac semiconductor with a zero gap. And um, what we uh, would expect if we put these this two, so ruthenium trichloride and graphene, we would expect that there is some charge transfer depending, uh, um, of course, um, on the nature of ruthenium trichloride, but we would expect some charge transfer. And therefore we may expect that there is some electron doping or hole doping in graphene so that the, and at the same time, because there is a strong lattice mismatch between these two lattices, we're going to expect possible strain effects on alpha ruthenium trichloride, which is what we are looking for. But on the other hand, we are also going to expect some charge transfer in uh, graphene, and then we may dope the graphene, which is also one of the, one of the objectives uh, in, the, in the world of graphene to try to get an homogeneous type of doping in these materials. So this is the, the, the basically what we started with. So one can with up initial, um, in fact, um, do simulations of this type of ethereal structures. And we are going to expect, as I said, str strain effects as well as possible doping because of this charge transfer. So these are the calculations that were done by uh, Sananda Wiesler here in Frankfurt. And um, this is what the uh, calculations predict. So they predict that there is, there is a strong charge transfer from the graphene layer to the alpha ruthenium trichloride layer. So basically the graphene layer becomes a whole dope. And this can be seen on the right um, in this band structure calculation where here is where our Dirac point is. So where the Fermi level would be in pristine graphene now by uh, making this type of heterostructures, we do have whole doping and our Fermi level is here. And what is very interesting now is that um, the, the basically the contribution of the alpha ruthenium trichloride is with these rather flat bands at the Fermi level. So we have these regions, which is here blow up, where we have our Fermi surface. Basically we have here these uh, hole pockets around the K point, K and K prime, and K and M, sorry, and K, I have to think about the, the brilliant zone. And we have whole pockets 
around and they are in fact these are not whole pockets they, they are open so around the gamma uh, the gamma point so these are the predictions of the calculation that we will have this important charge transfer and also that we will have strain effects uh, and this is what we were looking for and in fact when you do this type of calculations you have to you have to consider very different types of heterostructures to make sure that you are considering the most stable one and in the most stable one indeed um, what we observe is a strong enhancement of Kitayev interaction and you get rid of um, the other interactions, this, what I call the spurious one, basically uh, disappear. So these, these interactions are basically disappearing and this is the surviving one. Now, what is interesting from the point of view of now uh, this strain alpha ruthenium trichloride and that it's doped because the graphene is giving charges to alpha ruthenium trichloride is that if you now consider this type of um, what we used to call in the cuprate world, the TJ model, now it's going to be the TK model. Um, in fact, you can, you can get, uh, and this has been done in different type of works, you can get unconventional superconductivity, so even topological superconductivity. So this is a way maybe by using this, um, this KITAF type of materials to also go into this uh, uh, unconventional uh, superconductivity. But let me now go to the realizations. So these uh, kind of devices have been realized in many groups. One group is, in fact, the group of uh, Marco Buchard, uh, also here in Stuttgart. And uh, this is, in fact, their device where we have here this heterostructure. And these are the, the gold leads. So um, in fact, this is sandwiched into this um, uh, hexaboronitride. And then basically they measured transport. So they use basically the transport in graphene to um, measure what happens in graphene and how graphene in fact is now affected by this alpha ruthenium trichloride. So here are measurements, so magnetoresistance measurements um, as a function of magnetic field. So these are the Shubnikov that has uh, Van Alphen oscillations and in fact, um, the frequency of these oscillations is directly proportional to the amount of charge transfer that there is in the system. So in fact, they, they uh, find this charge transfer and they find that this is a whole doping that we're doing in graphene. Uh, what is interesting is, and this will be much more uh, discussed uh, tomorrow, I think it's tomorrow, yes, tomorrow by Johannes Knolla. What is interesting is now if you do the Fourier transform, the fast Fourier transform of these measurements, um, one observes here very well defined this, um, these uh, peaks that correspond to the fact that you are measuring these, uh, ele these um, whole pockets that I was uh, talking about. So this is a measure of this band structure that I was showing to you, that this is what it seems to be observed. But what is not what one would expect in principle. And on the other hand, this is what it's telling us information about uh, the alpha ruthenium trichloride is the temperature evolution of this fast Fourier transform amplitude, amplitude of the Schumnikos, uh, the husband of the oscillations, which is non-monotonous. So uh, if we go down in temperature, there is here, in fact, this non-monoticity so it's a non lipschitz kosevich type of behavior. And um, in fact, uh, Johannes Knolla and his student Valentin Lip, uh, they took uh, in fact what we obtained from, from our uh, density functional theory calculations. So basically assuming that now for ruthenium trichloride is described by a Kitayev um, Hamiltonian and then um, constructing um, condo type of interaction with the conducting graphene. And this is the, the condo coupling between the spins in the alpha ruthenium trichloride and the conduction electrons in graphene. And they can in fact then reproduce these anomalous uh, quantum oscillations as a function of temperature and normalized by the condo coupling. So tomorrow, uh, Johannes will tell the details of, of these um, experiments and theoretical uh, work. Um, what I want to say is that this is a, a scenario to explain this, uh, basically this uh, non-monotonous decay. And uh, of course, there are more scenarios that one can think of, but indeed, this uh, could be in fact a signature that with this 
a tensile um, strain on alpha ruthenium triglyceride, we approach it to uh, the limit of the Kitaev physics. Now, what we are doing now, more, um, uh, and this is now my last slide, I think, or almost the last sli slide. Now, what we are doing in this direction is to, um, to in fact, now uh, use these properties that we saw of this charge transfer between alpha ruthenium triglyceride and graphene, which in fact seems that it is um, rather optimal for these heterostructures um, in order to build PN junctions. And this we are doing it together with um, Eric Henriksen uh, in the US. So that what is uh, interesting is that by this type of heterostructures, one can um, very nicely, in fact, um, tune to uh, produce PN junctions. So even though here the physics of Kitayev in this type of PN junctions is not at forefront, what is at forefront is uh, in fact these uh, charge transfer properties of um, alpha ruthenium trichloride. So now um, I am, I don't know how much I'm doing with time. El Elio? Yeah. We have time till 45 and we'll have a couple of questions. So you're doing perfect if this is one of the last. Okay, so let me just, what I want to show to you is, I, I've been now discussing um, this, um, basically what happens with the, uh, with straining the lattice or how can I manipulate the lattice in order to really try to shift it into the region of more the, this spin liquid, the surviving of this spin liquid type of behavior. Now, let me just show you one slide and then uh, we can start with the discussion. One slide about this, um, the magnetic field and this, uh, the, 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 the role of applying a magnetic field where we suppress this exact order and then what happens in this region? Is there a region in between uh, where in fact uh, is seen this, um, this intermediate chiral spin liquid so what do we know from other measurements about this region in between? And what I want to show to you, and let me just here, what I want to show here is recent measurements. Um, well, now it's published in, in, in a few of letters um, by the group of Philip Gegenbart in, um, in um, Augsburg, where we have done the calculations on that, where the question is, do the thermodynamics in alpha ruthenium trichloride um, manifest or show you manifestations of a possible intermediate phase when you apply a magnetic field. Um, a and I have to be careful how we apply the magnetic field. Maybe let me show you this one because we saw that the, the description of this material is with these very anisotropic spin interactions. So it means that the system is going to respond very anisotropic to the application of the magnetic field. So it depends on in which direction I am applying the magnetic field, the response is going to be very different. And this can be seen in fact, in these um, measurements of um, in fact, the susceptibility and magnetization as a function of a magnetic field. As you can see here, if I apply a magnetic field perpendicular, so if I apply on the plane or perpendicular to the plane, the response is very anisotropic. So in fact, these results tells me, you see here we are, let me go to this one here uh, on, the, on the far right. I am at 60 Kelvin and still the, the magnetic field along um, the Z direction still is not saturating. So I'm far from the saturation values of my magnetization. So in fact, this is what we call the hard axis. So we, we should go to, to really uh, magnetic fields that are beyond 100 Teslas in order to start seeing some saturation. While in the magnetic field applied along the A and B direction, you see that one goes much faster into not fully polarized. We, will, we should go to infinite magnetic fields to have a fully polarization because we have all the time these quantum fluctuations because of these anisotropic interactions. Um, however, it's much easier to manipulate the system by applying these in-plane magnetic fields. So now going back to this thermodynamic measurement, so this is now the Grüneisen parameter, which is um, basically the um, ratio between the time derivative of the magnetization with respect to the specific heat. And this is now the measurements 
um, by a magnetic field applied parallel. So the magnetic field that can, in fact, manipulate the magnetism of the system best. So what, what one observes is the following. So when um, going um, with magnetic field, and this is now at very low temperature, so this is the ordered, um, the region where I ha we have the long range zigzag order, there is at about six Kelvin, uh, as you see a type of first order phase transition, which we know now what it is because there are also neutron scattering experiments on that. So there is in fact the, the magnet, the long range order changes the Q vector. So this happens because of the application of the magnetic um, field. And then at the a critical field um, BC2, there is then the disappearance of the long range order, as you can see with a strong response of the Grunheisen parameter. So the Grunheisen parameter is a very sensitive thermodynamic measurement of phase transitions. Now going beyond, and now the question is, is there this intermediate region after we have suppressed this long range order? So there is the most um, uh, response that one sees is this small shoulder here, which is already at 10 uh, Teslas. In fact, this small shoulder, there is no way to, um, to bring that as uh, talking about having um, a phase transition so that uh, there is no way from the thermodynamics to describe this as a phase transition. So what we think is that here, there is some type of um, basically crossing off uh, different type of excitations, but not a true phase transition as you would need if you have this intermediate chiral phase. So this is um, also another uh, measurement. This is from the group in, um, in Dresden where they measured the um, uh, magnetostriction. So the idea with this measurement is that you apply a magnetic field again in this um, parallel to the, to the plane. And you basically just um, measure the response of the lattice to uh, the application of the magnetic field. And as you can see, the lattice has a very strong response when um, this long range order is suppressed. And then you see the question is whether these shoulders that one sees here have anything to do with um, a second phase transition. So in this region of magnetic fields. So I just want to say that there is still a lot of discussion in bringing together these different, these different measurements on the magnetic field um, to um, describe whether one has this intermediate phase or not that has been reported in some of these uh, thermal hole conductivity measurements. Well, and with that, oh, wait, sorry. <laughs> with that, um, I would, before I end up, I would like to, of course, um, thank my collaborators in the work I presented, um, my group in Frankfurt, um, but there's, there are many, many other um, colleagues involved in, in some of the work I presented or I talked about, and of course our experimental colleagues in Oxford and, Oxford and Ames, and I would like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>